You found a podcast where you'll hear the truth, and we will praise Jesus' name. We stand for the Bible and won't back down from it, although it don't bring much fame. Some folks will like it, some will try to deny it, but God's Word will always stand true. It's been tried in the fire, still good in this hour. Hello, friends and faithful listeners. Time for the Pod King Bible Study. I'm your co-host, Donald King, and I'm joined by the host of this study, Brother Donnie King. On this podcast, we study the Bible from its original languages so we can understand the Word of God more clearly. We look at current events and news in light of scriptures, and we also examine some of the things going on within our culture from a biblical perspective. This is Monday, November the 6th, episode number 141, A Nobleman servant and a pool john 4 40 through 5 4 in our last episode we continued our series concerning false gods and goddesses by looking at one of each that is found within our very own bibles by name we dug into the backgrounds of dagon and diana and then we exposed what they were known and worshiped for we found some pretty interesting things regarding both of them and we felt that this information would help you. As always, we compared these to the one true God, and we also contrasted Him with them. If you think this would pique your interest, dive on in and give it a listen today. In today's study, we finish John 4, and then we enter into John 5, and the storyline is full of exciting things. As we end chapter 4, Jesus goes back into Cana of Galilee, and there He meets up with a nobleman. This nobleman has a servant that needs immediate help, and Jesus doesn't fail to come through for them. As we enter into chapter 5, we see a familiar scene. There is a man laid by the pool of Bethesda who is awaiting a chance to be healed of his 38-year-old infirmity. We throw in a good bit of Jewish culture along with a few word meanings, and wow, this is a powerful story, and you don't want to miss it. Now for the lesson and the teaching of God's Word. I'll turn it to the host of our podcast, Brother Donnie King. Well, we are very much delighted to have you along with us on this journey of truth. We really have an interesting study for you today, and we're going to be covering some powerful things just like you heard. Yes, sir. But as we roll through early November, putting pool in the title might not be as compelling as it would have been in the summer. Well, I intend to dive off into the scriptures in just a little bit, so I think it'll be all right. (laughs) Well, I hope we don't get into any subjects today that might sink us to the bottom. No, no, we won't. We have the best lifeguard ever because our lifeguard can walk on water. (laughs) Well, some of these studies leave me with my head barely above water. Uh, Come on over to the deep end of the pool. The water's fine here. (laughs) I guess we could keep on like this for a while, huh? Probably so, but I doubt those who are serious about a Bible study will hang around to see many more word plays that we can do about a a pool. (laughs) No joke. Uh, So we're going to be finishing chapter four and then starting chapter five today, right? Yep. That's exactly what I've got planned to do. Well, good. How long have we been in the book of John now? Uh, I believe our first episode came out on June the 12th, if I remember right. Why? Well, you mean that we've been doing this book study for nearly five months and we're just now going into the fifth chapter? Yeah. My goodness, at this rate, this study will take 21 months to complete. That's that's nearly two years. No, no, no. Calm down. We, we're going to be able to go through several of these chapters much faster than we did the first three or four. But it will probably take a year or better in all seriousness. Yeah, well, it only took eight months to go through the book of Revelation, though. Yeah, and you grumble and complain most of the way through that study. Please tell me you're not going to start that again. Uh, I'm not making any promises, but on a related note, do you want me to start doing some of the teaching part? I think I could get us done much faster. Yeah. As a matter of fact, I'm going to read John 4 and 40 through 45 to get us started. Hey, hey, you're not even going to answer me? The only answer I have is through the scriptures right now. (laughs) John 4 and 40 through 45 says... So when the Samaritans were come unto him, they besought him that he would tarry with them. And he abode there two days, and many more believed because of his own word. And said unto the woman, Now we believe, not because of thy saying, for we have heard him ourselves, and know that this is indeed the Christ, the Savior of the world. Now after two days he departed thence and went into Galilee, for Jesus himself testified that a prophet hath no honor in his own country. 
Then when he was come into Galilee, the Galileans received him, having seen all the things that he did at Jerusalem at the feast, for they also went into the feast. The first two verses here tells us that the Samaritans come unto him, and they wanted him to stay with them, to tarry with them. He abode there a couple of days. You know, it seems that this portion of scripture might be contradicting what I said in last week's study concerning the people believing on Jesus because of the woman's word. But it really doesn't contradict it, I don't believe. No, I don't believe it contradicts it at all because the Samaritans who come out to Jesus also ended up believing on him. That's true. And then they asked him to stay a little while, and he did for two more days. And the word that is used here is besought. Besought is the Greek word eratau. Eratau describes a strong request. That means that they pretty much begged him to stay, and he decided to. But I believe that the informative part that we need to see is found in verse 41. (laughs) Oh, yeah? Well, what is that informative part then? Well, it says right here, many more believed on him because of what he said and not because of the woman's testimony. They even told the woman as much in verse 42. That's right. And in our English KJV, we have, now we believe, not for your saying. In the Greek, there's the word ukati. Ukati means no longer. In other words, they were saying, we no longer believe because of your saying. Now we believe for ourselves. Oh, wow. That that means that they began to believe on Jesus through her word, but now they believe because of his word. That's right. <laughs> I think it's very powerful for it's portraying the idea that many of these Samaritans came out to see Jesus just because of the woman's word. Yeah. Well, but they no longer believed on Jesus because of her word. That That sounds like true faith to me. Yes, it is. They said that they heard him for themselves, and now they know of a surety that he is the Christ that was to come, the Savior of the world. To me, this gives even more credence to Romans 10 and 13 through 18 and the fact that faith comes by hearing and hearing by the word. You know, true faith is when we believe on Christ because of his word and not someone else's word. That's right. When it says that many of them believe, the Greek word polis is used, and it means a great much of them. That's a description of a large number of people. Yeah, well, down south in Georgia, they'd say that was a heap of people who believe. That's right. (laughs) There was a brother we went to church with for years, Brother Butler. He was an elder man, but he would say that just about every Sunday, teaching Sunday school, there's a heap of people that believe that. (laughs) heap of people. (laughs) The part about Jesus being the Savior of the world, ties in with a couple of other scriptures in a few places. First John 4 and 14, he says, And we have seen and do testify that the Father sent the Son to be the Savior of the world. First Timothy 4 and 10. For therefore we both labor and suffer reproach because we trust in the living God who is the Savior of all men, especially of those who believe. In John 4 and 43 and 44, we find that he departed from there two days later and went into Galilee. Jesus himself had testified that a prophet had no honor in his own country. John confirms the fact that Jesus spent two days with these Samaritans. What do you think them two days might have been like? I imagine that was pretty glorious, don't you? Oh, yeah. And then he leaves, goes to Galilee, and he tells us that at some point Jesus bore witness to the fact that a prophet doesn't have any honor in his own country. Well, that idea is pretty common, you know, for a person that's very familiar to to not be received as well as some one people don't know. That's right. I've seen that happen. I want to share a couple of verses that reinforce that point. In Matthew 13 and 57, they were offended in him. But Jesus said unto them, A prophet is not without honor, save in his own country and in his own house. John 7 and 41 and 42, others said, This is the Christ. But some said, Shall Christ come out of Galilee? Hath not the scripture said that Christ cometh out of the seed of David and out of the town of Bethlehem where David was? You know, in that verse you read in John 7, you can see this idea clearly on display. Therefore, we must realize that this statement is certainly true. Yes, and it's true in the sense that everyone looks at a man as a hometown fella if he's been around. When people know you well... They know all of your faults and all of your failures. Yeah, and this is what makes it harder for you to reach them. When you know a group of people well, there's a certain amount of intimidation that factors in. Yes, and I found that out when I began preaching because the people that I grew up around and that saw me from the time that I was a young guy growing up and beginning to start into the ministry, when I take the pulpit, it was in my mind, these are the people that have taught me, and I'm going to get up and preach to them. It was very intimidating. And you know what? You can see this manifested through hard feelings and bad attitudes towards people that you know. 
If you don't like somebody, it's hard to accept them. If you even like them, it's kind of hard to accept that God would speak to them. I mean, that's my old buddy over there. It's more difficult to believe that God's speaking through the guy that we all know than it is for us to believe the guy that nobody knows anything about. Why do you believe things are that way? It gives us the feeling of the mysterious, I believe. And somehow it seems more believable when a guy that we don't even know tells us something about God. It's like, wow, this man, he's deep. He knows all of these things. But what they don't realize is where he come from, the people would feel about him like you do about the people that you go to church with. John 4 and 45 says, Then when he was coming to Galilee, the Galileans received him, having seen all the things that he did at Jerusalem at the feast, for they also went into the feast. To me, this verse is fairly self-explanatory, telling us that the people of Galilee received him this time. There was a specific reason, though, that they received him. John said it's because they saw everything that he'd done at the feast in Jerusalem. Yeah, and that lines up with what a couple of the verses bear witness to, John 2 and 23, when he was in Jerusalem at the Passover and the feast day. Many believed in his name when they saw the miracles which he did. John 3 and 2, Nicodemus said, Rabbi, we know that thou art a teacher come from God, for no man can do these miracles that thou doest, except God be with him. There were many at the feast who believed on him after they saw what he did, so some of them must have been from Galilee. Even Nicodemus conceded that the things that Jesus was doing had to be done through God. What did this mean? All Jesus had done at this point was turn the water into wine at Cana in Galilee and whatever it was that he did at the feast in Jerusalem. Yeah, we really don't know what all he did in Jerusalem, so it's kind of hard to say. But there was enough proof in his actions that tied in with several of the scriptures. So this may be why they were believing on him. They were putting two and two together. It seems to have been the miraculous things he did that convinced them, though. I agree. It does seem that way. I need to read the remainder of John chapter 4 right here, John 4 and 46 through 54. So Jesus came again into Cana of Galilee, where he made the water wine, and there was a certain nobleman whose son was sick at Capernaum. When he heard that Jesus was come out of Judea into Galilee, he went unto him and besought him that he would come down and heal his son, for he was at the point of death. Then said Jesus unto him, Except you see signs and wonders, you will not believe. The nobleman saith unto him, Sir, come down, ere my child die. Jesus saith unto him, Go thy way, thy son liveth. And the man believed the word that Jesus had spoken unto him, and he went his way. And as he was now going down, his servants met him and told him, saying, Thy son liveth. Then inquired he of them the hour when he began to amend. And they said unto him, Yesterday at the seventh hour the fever left him. So the father knew that it was at the same hour in the which Jesus said unto him, Thy son liveth, and himself believed, and his whole house. This is again the second miracle that Jesus did when he was come out of Judea into Galilee. So now we have Jesus coming back into Cana of Galilee, and John wants to make sure we remember the first miracle that Jesus performed there. He speaks of Jesus turning the water into wine right here. That that seems to be mentioned a lot in this book. It does. The word nobleman is the Greek word basilikos. Basilikos describes a ruler of some kind. What kind of ruler do you think it would be? Well, the word is usually interpreted as a royal official or somebody who works under a dignitary or possibly even a king. Either way, this man had a son that was sick back in Capernaum. Well, this man heard Jesus was coming to his area and he went to him. This is exactly what all the lost people of our generation needs to do. Come to Jesus. Amen. He besought Jesus that he would come and heal his son for he was near unto death. Jesus told him, said, except you see signs and wonders, you won't believe. The nobleman said to him, sir, come down before my child dies. Jesus answered this man similar into the way that he responded to a few other people in the Bible. Yeah, exactly like the Syrophoenician woman. It makes you wonder why Jesus did this at times and with certain people. Yeah, because he only did it a few times and it was really strange when he did, but I know he was doing it for a purpose. Jesus doesn't say yes. He doesn't say no. He doesn't say okay. and He doesn't even say maybe. He simply states to the man, unless you see a sign or a wonder, you won't believe. Do you believe that to be the truth of the matter with this man? Did Jesus just say this for an unknown reason? I personally believe it's possible that Jesus was testing this man for faith. Yeah, well, Jesus gives the implication that the man doesn't have the faith to believe without having first seen a miracle. But in reality, I believe Jesus may have even been speaking to the Galilean crowd as he answered this man. You think so? Well, if you remember, John set the story off with that idea. They were in Galilee, people had gathered around, and so maybe this was for the people that were standing around. 
Either way, the nobleman answered him with a plea, Sir, come down ere my child die. In his plea, I believe you can see a seed of faith. The man began to word this in such a way that you can see the faith in his response. Hey, in case someone listening doesn't see what you're saying, explain what you mean by that. Okay. Well, he gives us the idea that he believed that if Jesus would come to his house, his child would not die. That's the implication. Please come down before he die. In other words, if you can get there, I don't think he'll die. This is similar to how Mary and Martha felt about Jesus coming for Lazarus. In John 11 and 21 and John 11 and 32, Martha said unto Jesus, Lord, if thou hast been here, my brother had not died. Then later, Mary was come to where Jesus was, and she saw him, and she fell down at his feet, saying, Lord, if thou hast been here, my brother had not died. How did this man know that Jesus could do this? How did he know that Jesus had this kind of power? You know, it it doesn't tell us. The Bible doesn't say. But most likely, I believe that he knew it through what he had heard about Jesus. I would guess. I, I don't really know no other way to answer that. John 4 and 50, Jesus saith unto him, Go thy way, thy son liveth. And the man believed the word that Jesus had spoken unto him, and he went his way. Now, it took faith just for the man to walk away on what Jesus said. To me, it seems pretty obvious that Jesus perceived the faith that this man had at this point. I believe that he perceived it from the very beginning. I also believe this is why he sent him on his way and told him that his son was going to live. John says that the man believed the word Jesus spoke to him. It appears that the main proof that this man believed Jesus is he simply left and went on his way as soon as Jesus said what he did. That's right. And I've actually heard some people put a negative spin on this. They said that he left to go home and see if his son was healed or not. I don't believe that at all. I don't either. For if that was so, there would not have been a healing in this setting and everything about this storyline would have changed quickly. That's right. The word of interest to me here is liveth. It's the Greek word zio. Liveth is zio and zio means to be alive and it can mean to live again, which can imply a resurrection. So there's a very small possibility that death had already closed its grip on this boy and his life might have literally been leaving him at the very moment Jesus spoke those words. And either way, the boy then revived. You know, I don't reckon I've heard that before, but boy, that sure puts a new spin on it for me. That really shines a spotlight on this man's faith even greater. I agree. Let me read you 51, 52, and 53 together, and we'll look at this. And as he was going down, his servants met him and told him, saying, Thy son liveth. That's when he inquired of what hour he began to amend. And they said to him, Yesterday at the seventh hour, the fever left him. So the father knew that it was at the same hour in which Jesus said unto him, Thy son liveth. And the results of that is the man believed and his whole house. So the man's heading home, and some of his servants come meeting him. To me, that would strike fear in my heart thinking the worst, thinking here they come to tell me he's dead or he's gotten worse. They told him, your son is living, which is really a little differently from how we would say this today. We would say, well, it looks like your son's going to make it or it looks like he's going to be fine now. (laughs) But they told him, your son's living. But it was at this point, the man asked them what time the boy started getting better. Uh, He was interested to know the exact details of all this. They told him it was around the seventh hour when the fever left him. The man knew that this was the exact same time that Jesus had spoken to him. That's right. And because of this great miracle, the man and his whole house believed in Jesus. Now, we don't know how many people's in his house. We know at least him and his son. But there was more people because there were servants that come. So I believe that even means the servants. Through this man's faith in the Lord, this healing was made possible. In this fourth chapter, we've already seen the woman at the well believe in him. Then there were many of the Samaritans who believed on him. Yeah, and then we have some of them from Galilee who believed, and then this nobleman and his whole household placed their faith in him. John's gospel is based on belief, and it was written to provoke others to believe in Jesus Christ. The last verse of this chapter is very short. It says, this is again the second miracle that Jesus did when he was come out of Judea into Galilee. John reminds us that this is the second miracle Christ has performed, which I think is a little interesting. There have actually been numerous miracles mentioned within this book, but John says there's two. John also reminds us of where these miracles have taken place. What do you think the reasoning is with the discrepancies about the number of miracles? 
I simply believe John's letting his audience know that if Jesus could do one or two miracles, this was not the end of the miraculous workings of the Lord. I believe he was also, in essence, telling them that there was going to be much more to come. But he's not listing the many miracles that was done at the feast. He's listing a certain number because he's trying to prove a point. Well, that makes a lot of sense, really. But that also leads to another false belief that is blazing around the country right now. Yeah, you're right. And I want to let our audience know that it doesn't take miracles to validate the ministry of Jesus Christ nor the work of Christ. Some people say that if he doesn't do miracles, then you have no proof he is the Savior or the Messiah. I disagree wholeheartedly. For he is the Messiah. He is the Word. He is the Son of Man. He's the Son of God. He's worthy of worship whether he ever performs another miracle or not. You know, that's right. If the Lord never healed another person or performed another miracle, he's still worthy of our worship simply because of who he is. Amen. Well, we're ready to enter chapter five now. So I'm going to read the first four verses and we're going to get started here. All right. After this, there was a feast of the Jews and Jesus went up to Jerusalem. Now there is at Jerusalem by the sheep market, a pool, which is called in the Hebrew tongue, Bethesda, having five porches. In these lay a great multitude of impotent folk, a blind, halt, withered, waiting for the moving of the water. For an angel went down at a certain season into the pool and troubled the water. Whosoever then first after the troubling of the water stepped in was made whole of whatsoever disease he had. Now, in these first two verses, John tells us a lot of info. As a matter of fact, John is very, very specific according to time and places. And he says that as after all of these things, that he's already told us about, that there was another feast of the Jews. Since Jesus was a Jew, he went up to Jerusalem as well. But John doesn't say which feast this was, but we know the Passover had already been celebrated earlier at the end of chapter 2. That's true, but several people believe this is the Feast of Purim. Others say that it has to be the Feast of Weeks or the Feast of Tabernacles. There's really no way to prove this in all the reality. Well, in one way, I guess it really don't matter in one sense. No, but the KJV tells us about a pool near the sheep market, but nearly everyone agrees that this should be called the sheep gate. There were several different gates and entrances around the temple, and one of those was known as the sheep gate. The Bible tells us this gate is also referred to as Bethesda in the Hebrew language. That's right, and within this gate, there were five porches. Well, there's so much attention to detail because John is so descriptive. That's right, and we also know that he's detailing this scene for a specific reason, though. The Sheep Gate was on the northern end of the temple complex. Wasn't this the part of the outer wall of Jerusalem that Nehemiah rebuilt? Yeah, yeah, and for more on the Sheep Gate, I'll tell you what, let me look it up real quick, because I I think I can find it easily. It's in Nehemiah 3. Uh, There's a couple places here, and then I'll go to Nehemiah 12, because it mentions the Sheep Gate in all of these. Nehemiah 3 and 1, then Eliashib the high priest rose up with his brethren the priest and they builded the sheep gate, they sanctified it and set up the doors of it. Then it goes down tells where it was. All right, verse 32, let me drop down here. It says, and between the going up of the corner unto the sheep gate repaired the goldsmiths and the merchants. Going to Nehemiah 12 and it's down here near the end, let's see, verse 39. And from above the gate of Ephraim, and above the old gate, and above the fish gate, and the tower of Hananiel, and the tower of Mia, even unto the sheep gate, and they stood still in the prison gate. I thought I remembered reading about this in the book of Nehemiah. I guess the thing I've always thought was odd here in John 5 is that this is a pool, but it also has five porches to it. Really odd. (laughs) Yeah, yeah, it is. But that's because there's a misunderstanding on the word porch here. The word that we see translated as porches, when you look at the original Greek, it actually interprets as arches or a colonnade or porticos. It comes from a word which means to be carried, such as a wall being carried over by an arch. It was most likely an open-air area that was under a roof that was held up by pillars, similar to what a camp meeting might would be that's outdoor. It's got a roof over it, but yet it's open all the way around it. Oh, well, that really clears things up in my mind a lot better. Yes, and it's right here in this area considered the porches that there was a great multitude of impotent folk, blind, halt, withered, waiting for the moving of the water. And the Bible tells us that an angel would come down at a certain season into the pool and he would trouble the water. Whoever would get into the water first after this happened would be made whole of whatsoever disease he had. You know, in these five arches lay a huge group of people, and it appears that none of them were even healthy. 
I know it. It makes you wonder why they congregated here. What Were they gathering here and then this started happening? There's a couple of ways to read and understand the next statement that John makes. There's also a debate concerning how it should be worded. It could be understood that this is a list. In these lay a great multitude of impotent folk, and then it lists them, blind, halt, and withered. Or it could be understood that impotent folk is a description of all of them together, the impotent, the blind, the halt, and the withered. Well, which is it? Do you know? I personally lean towards the fact that impotent folk is the description, and then the terms listed after it are describing the people. All of them were impotent. Some were blind. Some were halt. Some were withered. The word impotent is the Greek word astheneo. It means to be sickly, weak, or ill. Either way you look at it, all of these people were burdened with some sort of sickness or some debilitating disease. We know some of them were blind while others were halt, which means lame or crippled. What does it mean when it says some were withered? You know, I've looked that up before, and a lot of people are torn on it, but most people do agree that it means it, it, to be paralyzed of some sort. I don't know what would cause the paralysis, but to be just shriveled up, their hands shriveled up, maybe through even a stroke or something, how they, you see people shrivel up at times, one side of their body, they can't use it. it. It could be something like that. But before we leave this today, I got to bring this up. There's a lot of debate concerning verse 4, because none of the older manuscripts even had this verse in them. Most scholars believe that this verse was added in at a later time, much later time, by a scribe who was trying to interpret what John said in verse 7. You know, that's funny if you think about it. If verse 4 wasn't there, verse 7 would be verse 6, wouldn't it? (laughs) (laughs) That's right. And, you know, it's really true. But either way, this is the only mention within Scripture of such a thing happening. And your point is... Well, it seems that something so magnificent as an angel coming down, stirring the waters and somebody getting healed, it seems like it might have been recorded more than once in the Bible or somebody else making allusion to it. Even history doesn't hold any other information for us about this happening. Well, now, are you expressing doubts as to whether this should be in the Bible or not? No, but let me lay this out for you. We're told that an angel went down at a certain season. He entered the pool, and then he troubled or agitated the waters is the actual wording in the Greek. Whoever would get in the water first would be healed of whatever disease or sickness they had. Now, just the thought of that's pretty amazing, but it causes me to have a lot of questions. Why did the troubling of the water only result in one healing? Now, that's a good question, but boy, I don't have a good answer for it. (laughs) Well, it seems like to me if the water was troubled, if everybody jumped in the water at the same time, everybody would get healed. Now, I have thought about that before myself. What do you think it was about this that healed the person? Well, okay, I'm not positive, but it must have something to do with the angel, wouldn't it? Well, and that's what most people believe, but that leads me to another question right here. Do angels have the power to heal people? Goodness gracious. Well, either way you answer that question, it seems like the wrong answer. That's right. And I don't want anybody to get confused concerning my questions of this. I'm not saying that I doubt that this happened. I'm not saying that I don't believe this verse should be in the Bible. But many sources say that they believe this is more of a legend than an actual occurrence. Is that even possible for the Bible to record a legend as if it truly happened? I reckon we'll answer that and many other things in next Monday's study, Lord willing. But I ask those questions for a reason, because if we never think about the hard things, will miss a lot of the joy of learning when we read. And so, do angels hold the power to heal people? Mm, Not that I know of, but (laughs) something was going on here. And why did nobody else ever mention this? Maybe it didn't need to be mentioned more than once. One one time was good enough. I I don't know. I I don't really have very good answers for it. But I hope I do have a good answer for the question of the day, because I think it's about time for that, ain't it? It's, It's time. I've got it right here. Are you ready? I think I'm ready. All right. Who do you believe wrote First and Second Chronicles? I've heard that a scribe may have written them, but it bothers me to think that some unnamed person may have written something into our Bibles. I find that last part pretty amusing. I really do. All right. Let me ask the questioner a question. What difference would it make if the person was unknown or anonymous? Why would that bother you? Because there's many books of the Bible that a lot of scholars are not certain who actually wrote it. We think we know who wrote it, such as the book of Job. Some people don't believe that Job wrote the book of Job, but it's got his name on it. Some people say they believe with all their heart Moses wrote the first five books of the Bible. He wasn't born until Exodus. So what we read in Genesis had to be stories that were retold to Moses or God completely gave him the rehearsal of it as he wrote it. 
Moses wasn't there to see it firsthand. Does that bother you that he wasn't there to see it happen, even though he recorded it? Let me put it this way. The Holy Ghost is the actual author of the Word of God. So it really wouldn't matter who the tool was that he used to get the job done, would it? So now I need to answer this question. Who do I believe wrote the Chronicles? Well, as always, I have a couple of opinions, so I'm going to give them both to you. Number one, somebody wrote parts of it early on around the time of Samuel, Saul, maybe even into David. And then others contributed to it as time went on. So there could be a compilation of different authors over hundreds of years because there was many kings that was ruling over this time period. And there was several hundred years that went by. There couldn't be one person that lived through all of that. But there is a problem with this view. And this is why I lean more towards my second view. All right, let me give you my second view. I believe a scribe did write these books based off the information he knew and maybe even possessed actual historical documentation. That means that somebody else may have wrote it down and passed it along and then he compiled the information and it become first and second chronicles. Plus, add in the fact that he was moved on by the Holy Ghost so we don't have to worry about his accuracy. You might be surprised to know that the majority of scholars believe that first and second chronicles was written by Ezra or at least by a scribe who worked with Ezra. As a matter of fact, several leading scholars believe that 1st and 2nd Chronicles, Ezra, the book of Nehemiah, and even Job itself was written by Ezra and his contemporaries. There's really no way to prove who wrote any of them, but this is what I would go with above all the other theories that are out there. I believe that the Holy Ghost moved on somebody and they wrote it and recorded it because it's definitely inspired writing because it lines up with all of the other holy scriptures, and there's nothing that stands out that is wrong in it, nothing that stands out that would be a discrepancy. So I fully trust whoever it was, whether it was Ezra or some person we'll never know till we get to heaven. I don't have a problem with that, and I don't think you should let it bother you. I think you should just trust in the scriptures as God gave them to us. Amen, Brother Donnie. Good answer. It's in the Word of God, and I'll take it for that. Amen. All right. Remember, friends, if you have a Bible question or a question regarding how news or current events or things going on in our culture are connected to Scripture, drop us an email at dkministries1977 at yahoo.com. That's dkministries1977 at yahoo.com. We hope you've enjoyed this episode today, sharing God's Word. But until next time, may God bless you all. Be sure and come back next Friday, November the 10th, for special edition number 107, Bacchus, the God who wrecks homes. This I know, will it change my heart all around? Put my feet back on the ground, got a bone. Now for heaven I want to go, I want to go, I want to go. To that land where the milk and honey flow. Oh, I've heard of such a place. I can't go there by God's grace. Never seen it, but I know I want to go.